In terms of excitement about the science of climate change, I would say even that won't tell us what to do because the way the real world behaves and the, real, the way a model behaves are different, even if they can be quite similar. Welcome to the Challenging Climate Podcast, where we discuss the big ideas and controversies in climate change with leading experts. I'm Jesse Reynolds, an environmental policy specialist. And I'm Pete Irvin, a climate scientist. The climate is changing. Join us as we try to keep up. In this episode, our guest is David Stainforth, a professorial research fellow at the London School of Economics. David has had a long career studying the climate problem and the challenges of making predictions of future climate change. His research spans the philosophy of climate science, climate economics, climate modeling, and decision-making under deep uncertainty. David has just published a new book, Predicting Our Climate Future, which is the topic of our conversation today. This book provides a clear, accessible, and comprehensive guide to the challenges of making predictions about future climate change. It also challenges some of the accepted practices of the climate modeling community and suggests some alternative ways forward. David, welcome to Challenging Climate. Your new book, Predicting Our Climate Future, is about the scientific and more than scientific, really the philosophical issues raised by making predictions about climate change. What are the main messages that you're trying to convey with the book? Well, I think I'm trying to convey a message that we need to get clever at understanding uncertainty in our climate predictions, and that our understanding, our scientific understanding of uncertainty is a core element of what we know about climate change. I've long been rather frustrated that possibly as a result of the, the, the skeptics, it has led to scientists wanting to perhaps not talk about the uncertainty as much as they might have liked to. And I think that's actually a debt to a wider public understanding of, of what climate change is. And so I wanted to write this book to sort of put that across and also to put across that I think there's some really interesting challenges out there, really fascinating fundamental challenges to do with climate change. And I don't think those are quite as widely recognized as I would like. You think that not confronting the uncertainty is ultimately contrary to the interests of those who advocate for climate action, that it can come around and bite them in the backside, if you will. Why might that be? So my instinct here is that uh, when, I, when I talk to people who are not scientists, not involved in climate change at all, there are a lot of people out there who are just not familiar with the details of climate change. And what I think they see when they hear about climate change is something that is, comes across as just a little bit too certain. The recognition of the uncertainty is what gives it credibility. It makes it feel right. But I should say, for me, the real message is of confidence. The things we know really, really well, the existence of the threat, the seriousness of the threat, I think these arise out of the uncertainty because you have the uncertainty, but for instance, you know, it doesn't include the possibility of, of no warming or indeed doesn't include much possibility of not significant warming. It's the uncertainty is very much skewed towards the more serious side. And so actually talking about it makes it seem more credible, but it also conveys the seriousness of the issue more strongly, in my view. Right. Your book opens with seven characteristics of climate change and climate change prediction that make it particularly difficult. I don't think we have the time to dive into all seven, but let's touch on a couple of them. The first cluster, the first half of these roughly, are characteristics of the climate system itself, the things that can be quantified, shall we say. What within these do you see as particularly challenging for making predictions that are useful for decision making? I would pick out two. One is nonlinearity. I think the consequences of climate system being a nonlinear complex system. I don't think people are as aware of, of the consequences of that. What I'm trying to say there is I think some people understand aspects of nonlinearity in terms of chaos, in terms of the butterfly effect. I think the study of climate change opens up the difficulties arising of, of, out of nonlinearity in a much broader sense. This is not just the butterfly effect. There are many other aspects that arise there, and that makes life pretty difficult. But the other aspect which makes it doubly difficult is what I call extrapolation. So we are driving the system, the climate system, into a state that it has never been in before. 
Now, that's shocking from a concern about climate change point of view, but from a science of climate change point of view, it says that our observations of the system are, are of observations of it in a different state to what we're interested in. And that means that you can't use the observations of the whole thing to give you a really good indication of what's going to happen. It's a more complex problem than that. And if I just elaborate a little bit more, if you think about weather forecasts, that too is a nonlinear system. It has all this complexity, but you've got some of the same nonlinearity problems. But you're not dealing with extrapolation. So you can test your models and say, look, do they work? Look at them. Yeah, they do. You know where you are. That's not the case with climate change. So extrapolation and nonlinearity would be my big ones. Shall I throw in a third? Well, let's go ahead and move on, and you can toss out a third one in the other cluster, if we could say so, of how climate change and our understanding of it relates to human thinking, to knowledge, decision-making, and to policy. There's challenges there. What's one within here that you might focus on? So that was exactly, yeah, where I was going to go. So I will pick out the one-shot bet characteristic. I think if you're going to do the science of climate change, of climate prediction well, as, as and this is widely understood in the climate change community, you have to embrace uncertainty. You're predicting, you're trying to predict a changing probability distribution of various climatic factors. So that might be local temperature, regional temperature, rainfall, whatever you like. But it's always going to be a probability distribution, um, even when you're talking about annual temperatures of a region you're still going to have some sort of probability distribution. That's the best you can hope of doing with a climate prediction. But in reality, there will be only one 21st century. So you might have made a good prediction, but there will be only one outcome. So that raises a very deep question, I think, of how we respond to risk. I think in my experience, we tend to respond to risk in a certain way, which builds from experience. We try something, then we try it again, we try it again, and we, we know how we, we respond in that repeated situation. But we don't have that repeated situation, which means we need to be asking ourselves, how do we value the future? Not in some average sense, but um, in a sort of risk-averse sense. And that also comes through to the economics of climate change and utility functions and who can... Before we move into diving into climate models, let's start with the very basics. Uh, what do we mean when we say climate? I've heard this joke, uh, what is it? Climate is what you expect and weather is what you get. Where can we draw that line between weather and climate? Weather and climate are things that there isn't a, a fixed boundary. But climate, for me, is, as you reference uh, the, the Heinlein quote, climate is what you expect. So you have some probability distribution. So you might have uh, summer temperatures in Chicago. You have some distribution there of what you would expect generally in any one year. That is climate. That distribution is climate. Climate change is the changing distribution. Weather is what happens on a particular day. But these things do morph somewhat because while weather might be what happens on a particular day, the weather forecast is already a day or two in advance. You're moving into some form of uncertainty that is a sub-distribution of the climatic distribution. So you already change. So I guess building on that, do we know what the current state of the climate is in 2023? <laughs> Nobody's asked me that before. And given what I say in the book, I have to say no. So that's not meant to be disagreeing with the IPCC. We, we know something about global mean temperatures. We know how it has changed. But when I think about the complexities of climate, I'm interested in not just global temperatures, but but regional, local information. We can't know what the climate is today, but we can build it up over the last sort of 5, 10, 20 years. And we can look at that distribution and say, is that different to the distribution that we might have had in the 1950s and 1960s? And on larger scales, it very clearly is. On smaller scales, when you're looking at temperature, it almost always is. But quite how it has changed is pretty difficult to say. Well, well, that's great. I guess your yeah, observations can't tell us the full answer. We've, we've got to, to some extent, go beyond those and we've got to extrapolate. And climate models are one of the ways we do this. We, we had Erica Thompson on, who I think was a colleague of yours, talk about her book, Escaping Model Land. But can you explain what is a climate model? Okay, so there are lots of different sorts of climate models. 
typically when we talk about climate models, we're talking about computer-based models where we break up the atmosphere and the oceans into grid points. And in each of, each of those grid points, we solve a set of equations that represent the movements of the fluid of the atmosphere, the fluid of the ocean, and, and various other aspects. And by solving those equations at uh, each grid point, you can take the state now and the equations will tell us what the state will be at some point in the future. The big point about these sort of climate models is they tend to have millions of grid points. So you've got to solve the equations at millions of grid points. And each time you solve the equations, it takes you a, a time step, a chunk into the future, which typically is around 10 minutes. So to simulate 21st century, you've got to repeat that many, many times. And then the other thing to throw in there, that's your sort of basic, it's not terribly basic, but um, that will get you the sort of circulation of the atmosphere and the oceans. But then you've got to have lots of other bits and pieces in there to represent the land surface, ice sheets, the sea ice. These aren't solved in the same way. The atmosphere and the ocean, you're solving kind of fundamental equations that we might well understand. We know they represent the universe. These other parts are perhaps closer to statistical representations of those elements of the system. If we happened to arrive by chance at a near perfect climate model, so one which had the same climate sensitivity and, and other properties that matched the real Earth, would we be able to confidently pick it out from the other models? Would we know that we had it right? So I, I, I don't think so. For uh, There must be quite a number of reasons. But the, but the reason that jumps to mind is, I said a few moments ago that climate change is a one-shot bet. That takes us into the future. It's a problem of, of how we interpret the future. But it's also a problem of how we use the uh, observations of the past. So I mentioned extrapolation. So the extrapolation and one-shot bet nature combine to make it almost impossible to know that we've got the right model. The extrapolation one says, look, we don't have observations of how the climate system has responded to uh, increases in greenhouse gases at the rate and the amount that we're seeing today. We haven't seen CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere that we have today for well over, certainly over two million years. But the point is the state of the Earth system, even that far ago, was going to be different to what we're seeing today anyway. So even if we had good observations from three, four, five million years ago, it wouldn't be a direct parallel. So we, we just don't have observations that can help us constrain and give us confidence that we have got the right model. And in more recent times, you're saying, well, actually, have we done a good job at simulating the 20th century, for instance? Our problem there is we only have one 20th century. We know there's quite a lot of variability. It could have looked different. That's not to say, in my view, it, it couldn't have not warmed. That's a basic response to trapping energy. So I'm not saying that one of the options is that it couldn't have warmed. No, that was inevitable. But what that pattern of warming would be, both over time and, and over regions, that could have been different which means it's very difficult to then know quite whether our models are doing a good job or a bad job. To put it a bit more sharply, I guess we have occasionally these very extreme flood events, you know, one in a thousand year flood events, but we've only got a hundred years of observation. So we're not going to be able to know all of the one in a hundred, one in a thousand year probabilities just from watching the last century. So if a model got it right, we wouldn't be able to tell necessarily. So, so I think kind of related to this is the butterfly effect, natural variability. And you made a point that I hadn't really thought too much about before. You distinguished, this maybe is getting a little nerdy, micro initial conditions uncertainty and macro initial conditions. How do we run these climate models and how does that micro and macro initial conditions play out? What, what am I talking about? I think our audience might not know. <laughs> Fair enough. I don't think many people know. <laughs> So micro initial condition uncertainty is your kind of conventional initial condition uncertainty. This is the butterfly effect. So if you're familiar with simple chaotic systems, that's the Lorentz 63 system. You might be familiar with that kind of two lobe drawing of a sort of butterfly where the path goes around two lobes. This is the Lorentz 63 system. If you start a path from anywhere in that system, it will track out that sort of picture of butterfly. But if you start two paths from very close to each other, at some point in time, they will diverge and do different things. That's essentially why weather forecasting is difficult. If you don't get the initial state perfectly, then at some point, two different simulations will do different things and you won't know which one is right. That's why we can only predict the weather sort of three, four, five days in advance, some limits in 
That's true. If even if we had the perfect weather forecast model, we still couldn't predict the weather more than a week or two in advance. Yes, that's right. And that's due to the butterfly effect that I'm referring to as micro initial conditions. You don't know perfectly how to start things off. With climate, you use that same micro initial condition uncertainty, kind of a butterfly effect, to set lots of simulations going, and they produce a distribution of what's going to happen 20, 40, 60 years in the future. That gives you a distribution. That distribution is based on the assumption that the model is right and the assumption that the starting conditions are almost right. You're just making the smallest of changes. The problem then is that we don't know the initial conditions anywhere near that well. There are large uncertainties in what those initial conditions could be. And that could happen on the land surface. It could happen in the cryosphere. But for me, I tend to think about it in terms of a state of the ocean circulations. We don't know the particular pattern, the particular locations, the strengths of the ocean circulations. So we take them from some long simulation of a, a model. The problem then is if you change those, if you take a different starting state, then that distribution in 40 years time or 20 years time, say, will be different. That's macro initial condition uncertainty, saying the distribution the climate forecast distribution is sensitive to the large scale differences in that starting state. Yeah. And these are these are much harder to know and much harder to simulate because the ocean is big and slow and difficult to work with. Yes. And uh, there's something really that I find really groovy about this, too, which I've been talking about with colleagues in the last couple of days. Some scientists that I've spoken to about this say, OK, so this this is great. Now we understand that. The aim is surely that we need to boost our observations. We need to go out and observe, particularly the ocean, a lot better. We need to know what state it's in. In terms of excitement about the science of climate change, I would say even that won't tell us what to do. Because the way the real world behaves and the, real, the way a model behaves are different, even if they can be quite similar. So to put that more into nerdy terms, the attractor of the, of the real world climate system is simply different to the attractor of a model. So it might be the model could give, give us really useful information, but quite what the best starting conditions are is not clear. It's certainly not what the observations are. How do we translate reality into model world? How do we make that connection? And I think that's one of those open questions. I don't think it's necessarily insoluble, but I don't think we know how to do it. So, so this is the issue that the model might have an ocean current a few degrees west of where the real world has it. Just that's where it wants to put it. So if you force the model to do what the real world is doing, it's going to spend some time adjusting to try and put the world right in its sense. And that's going to produce some weird signals. Yeah, absolutely. Which might compound over climate time scales to give you the wrong distribution even out 30, 40 years. But if you knew about that, basically saying if we're clever, if we know that the model has ocean circulations uh, a few kilometers to the west, then we could say, OK, let's go and get our observations and we're just going to translate those. We're not going to simply bias correct them. We're just going to translate them into where the model wants to put them. And that, I would argue, would give us a more useful climate prediction. So we've talked about how even if we had a perfect climate model, we, we've not completely solved the problem. There's still many challenges that we'd have in predicting the future and, and testing the model. But today's models are imperfect. And in part, that's because they're too coarse to resolve many important processes. Doubling the resolution of models is expensive, roughly about an order of magnitude of compute power to double the resolution. But the compute power is increasing quite rapidly. I think over the last generation, compute power has gone up by about an order of magnitude every three and a half years in these big supercomputers. Now that we're down to the kilometer scale, we're resolving convection. Is it not just a matter of time before we can reach that perfect model, we can get to high enough resolution? No. <laughs> so you mentioned one kilometer models. I, I may be wrong, I may not be quite up to date, but I don't think we have global centennial simulations of the one kilometer resolution. I think if, if we did, we would get much better representations of the atmosphere the atmospheric circulation would be improved. But climate is much more, much more than that. And so when you talk to the land surface modelers, and particularly the ecosystem modelers, which in interact with the land surface, which interacts with the atmosphere, the complexity of those systems is equal to or greater than that of the atmosphere. So it's, and, and what resolution do we need for those? Really have no idea. So I, I would argue that this chase for higher resolution will not get us to a model that's close to perfect. 
we don't we don't know what resolution we would need. We don't know a whole theory. We don't know some of the equations. We don't know how to represent mathematically some of the aspects of the system. So resolution won't get us there. So that's one answer to your question. The other is more philosophical and perhaps even more interesting. We don't know how close to reality a model needs to be to be said to be good enough. And this is the concept of the hawk moth effect. I don't know whether Erica spoke about this with you, um, but this was an effect named by Erica Thompson. And um, the concept here is that in, in nonlinear systems, if you have a perfect model and then you have another model that is not quite perfect, but almost just an epsilon difference, just a tiny bit different, then their predictions, their climate predictions, the predictions of changing probabilities, can for some time periods be entirely wrong. The slightly wrong model can get completely wrong predictions. Now, that's kind of a hypothesis. I talk about it a little bit in my book in terms of the, the logistic map. I think that's a nice illustration of the possibility, but I'm not myself saying that, that it is necessarily a complete a killer of the possibility of useful models. I'm, I'm not claiming that, but I am claiming that we don't understand that problem. And until we have questioned quite how good a model we need, simply filling our computers with higher resolution and more equations isn't going to give us confidence in our climate predictions. Well, one way that we, or well, the climate community tries to get confidence in its predictions is to take the set of imperfect models that different centers have produced semi-independently and go, well, you know, if 30 models all agree, surely the right answer's in there somewhere. What does such an approach miss? It misses the similarities between the models in different modeling centers, in particular, simply because all modeling centers are limited by the same sort of computational limits that we have. So they tend to include the same processes. So if there are processes that are missing from the models, they're likely to be missing from most of the models. If those are crucial, then all of the models will miss them out and they will all be wrong. In fact, the models are, are more similar than that. People share techniques as, as they should. It's ridiculous not to. Uh, you should learn from each other. But it does mean that as a consequence, the models have greater similarity because they do things in the same way. And then I'm not sure whether this is what your question was alluding to, but there are social pressures on modeling centers to both simulate observations reasonably well and to not be so different from other models. And not, nobody wants the outlier model because these models are used in policy. They're used in adaptation planning. So nobody wants an, an outlier model. So they tend to cluster together. But in terms of understanding climate predictions, in terms of understanding the science of climate change, what we actually want is a load of models that are much wider than that, to, that do lots of different things, so that we can look at them and say, actually, we don't believe that one because the processes that it's representing are unphysical. We know how these things work and that's wrong, so we don't trust it. When we only have models that cluster together, that all represent things in the same way. We don't have that opportunity of constraining uncertainty. So we don't really understand uncertainty. So I guess kind of connected to this, it seems a strategy that most modeling centers have been followed is sort of what we're describing. You know, they get a brand new supercomputer, they add more processes, they boost up the resolution, and then they run the model just enough times to get into the IPCC. Should we be devoting our energies there or would it be better to start thinking a little differently? I mean, I, I guess I'm thinking of, should we come up with a new class of model, a, a mini global circulation model, a mini GCM that's like a hundred times faster. And then every modeling center tries to produce, you know, 50 variants of this, their mini model. And would that be a better way forward now? Yes, it would. I think that would be a great idea. I think diversity in models would be really helpful and encouraging modeling centers to create that diversity would get us a lot more information about climate change. Great. Well, let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. Yeah. I, I think it would also be a much better use of computing resources. As you say, the computing resources are massively increasing and we should use it. The question is how to use it. And I am not in favor of just increasing the resolution. What you propose there, I think, would be a, a great way forward. Yeah. All right. You've heard it, listeners. Mini GCMs, that's the way forward. So in, in your book, you talk about some of the 
challenges of client predictions. And I think some of the challenges are related to how we're using them. What are we using these predictions for? So I just want to run through a few different applications and just so for you to sort of reflect on those. First, are we sure that we have a climate problem? I mean, this is now a given, I think. But when should we have been sure that we had a climate problem? Well, that's a nice question. Uh, when should we have been sure we had a climate problem? This isn't a question I've thought long and hard about. So speaking very much on the hoop, I would say around 2000, um, I think we knew. I've heard uh, colleagues say, actually, we should market at 1990, the Earth Summit. And there's a strong argument for that. Um, so maybe it's a personal history there, here. That's when I started to get interested in climate change. But I think by 10 years later, Kyoto had been agreed but not signed. I think the science to know we were looking at serious warming, that, that humanity is the cause of it, and that that was going to severely disrupt human societies. I think that information was probably solidly there. I'd love to know your opinions. Yeah, I mean, that's a little before my time. I mean, I, I started my PhD in 2009. Was it the ocean that was the big problem that sort of was the final thing to get figured out? Because it seems, you know, it contains an awful lot of heat, has an awful lot of variability. Was that the big thing holding us back? Certainly. I, I mean, I picked that sort of period around 2000. And I think around then is when, I don't know if it had CM3, but the sort of the effective coupled atmosphere ocean models were starting to be widely used. So an understanding, I think an understanding of the ocean's role had developed quite a long way during the 90s. Um, was it holding us back? I think it probably was, actually. I think it needn't have done, uh, but I think it probably did. As you've seen, sort of in my book and sort of uh, one of the early chapters, I try to sort of hone down, why is it I'm concerned about climate change? What is it that makes me believe that this is a crucial issue? And I tried to do that in 11 paragraphs, which is ridiculous. It was going to be 10, but I just, it, there just had to be one more. And the, the last few of those deal with the social science aspect. It's sort of what does it mean to me or, or to you? And I think we can answer that, but it is in woolly terms. You can answer it in terms of it's going to be big. It is already big as now, but it's going to get even bigger, that it will impact all of us in a very severe way. And I think you could say that now even though I don't think we necessarily have the quantified predictions that we might want for that. But you don't need them. You can just think, how do our social systems work? And you can know that's the case. So if I then put that into the physical side, I think we could probably have said much earlier than 2000, actually, we know something about how the ocean works. It's the likelihood on a risk basis, the likelihood that the oceans are just going to take up all this excess heat and we're just going to be OK was never terribly credible. But I think we were in a, by the time sort of 2000, between 2000 and 2005, we were sort of solidly, yeah, we understand. Let's move on to a more difficult one. Adaptation decisions. Are our models good enough to make reliable predictions of specific hazards in specific places so that we can make concrete adaptation decisions? No, they are not up to that. By and large, but not always, adaptation decisions are quite local decisions. There are whole issues of how you how you respond if you have a portfolio of assets, by which I, I simply mean maybe you're trying to build flood defences for villages and, and towns across the UK, for instance, uh, that, that sort of portfolio. But by and large, you're saying, OK, I have this location. I want to know something about what the future climate will be so that I can adapt in, in anticipation. Our models are, are not up to providing that sort of detailed regional behaviour, the probability of different flood risks in, in different locations. Having said that, I do think we have knowledge, even at the subglobal scale, about certain aspects of changes that can be useful for adaptation. So I'm being very UK centred here, but you can sort of think what's going to happen to rainfall in winter in, in the UK. And you can say, well, we get our weather from the West. There's an ocean to the west. The ocean's not going to go away. The climate is going to warm. The atmosphere is going to warm. It's going to hold more water vapour as a result. Chances are it's going to get, get wetter in winter. There are some footnotes you need to add to that, quite what the storm trust is going to do. It could move north, it could move south. There are some issues there. It's not a certainty. But if, there, if you're going to bet on it, you bet it's going to increase in rainfall in winter. And that in itself is a useful thing to feed into adaptation planning. 
And I think you can go even further. Well, I would go even further than that and say you can use the models to explore what sort of behavior could be possible. And I think that could be useful for adaptation too. So I think there's ways of using the models, but we just need to be a little bit cautious and aware of uncertainties. And we shouldn't expect them to give us the answer, even in a probability sense. We should expect them to give us help and indications of the sorts of things we should be preparing. So another application, perhaps the, perhaps the trickiest, is to identify optimal climate policies. How quickly should we cut emissions? What is the social cost of carbon? Is our understanding good enough to do that? No, I don't think so. I seem to be saying no quite a lot. But <laughs> my gut response to that question is that it feels to me like quite an academic desire to have the optimal climate policy. I think maybe I've shifted in writing my book and I... I'm much more about trying to find the optimal climate policy just doesn't seem to be a very useful thing to do. Um, what we should be doing is we should be making policy that works. We should be allowing and encouraging politicians and populations and electorates to engage in climate policy debate. And that means giving them the freedom to have their views on climate policy. It, it shouldn't be something for academics say, this, this is what you have to do. Having said that, what that debate needs to be about is how we respond to the known threats of climate change. So um, speaking to friends and colleagues over the last few weeks, a sort of a perfect situation for me in the UK, for instance, would be if you've got the Labour Party and the Tory Party really battling it out and disagreeing about the particular policies they're going to put in place to achieve net zero by 2050. They, they should be allowed to, to disagree and they should be seen to disagree. We should have options there. But we shouldn't really be arguing about whether we should be aiming for a net zero by 2050 or, or earlier. I'm, I'm not a policy expert, so I don't want to go into those sorts of details. But I do think there's a, there's a whole engagement of people in the problem, which is completely dodging your question. So to answer your question in a slightly different way, so, so I'm, I'm not an economist. But my impression is that the uncertainties that come from the physical science um, aren't necessarily seen as a fundamental problem in creating the right to policy from an economics perspective. I think they should see it as much more of a barrier because I don't think the physical scientists can produce the probabilities that they actually want. Um, so there's a lot of miscommunication between the disciplines, which is a problem. But on top of that, when you're trying to create a good policy, you simply have to allow for how you're going to value the future, just usually in terms of discount rate. You would need to make some assumptions about growth rate, which are adventurous at best, and you need to include some sort of allowance for the utility function, which you assign to, to people. And I think this is where I it's sort of come back to this point that the academics kind of want to solve the problem and then hand it over. I think for me, as who's not an economist, but have sort of taken an interest in this area, I would see, for instance, the utility function as something that we should be going out and allowing people to engage with. How much do you value the rainforest? How do you, much do you value having a climate that means your government isn't always spending its money to, to help people recover from floods? It's sort of let people engage with that rather than asking economists to go out and say, well, we've assessed how people have behaved in the past and we conclude this is the right utility function to apply. I wonder whether uh, Jesse's got something to add to that. Not directly to add to that. Uh, what I think I'm curious about, I've been listening to the two of you talk for about a half an hour uh, and I read the book. A large portion of both the previous conversation and the book described the limitations of climate modeling and making decisions based on that. David, if you were the benevolent dictator of climate modeling and climate policy, what would you change about how models are used, whether this is internal, you know, which models are used and how they parameterize this or that, or external to the models, how people use the information that models generate? What would you change that you think would have the, the greatest marginal value in better decision making? Adaptation decision making. I would take up Pete's suggestion and have a diversity of models. I would encourage modeling centers to building diversity. I would uh, develop experiments that are designed to explore model 
uncertainty within the consequences of uncertainty in the way we build our model. But most of all, I would encourage investment in, in expertise, in training people. Yeah, so at the moment, we've got a lot of people who are scientists, climate scientists or climate economists or, uh, or the like. I, I, I think there's a real need for there to be essentially careers for people, for, for experts uh, who have been trained to understand the opportunities to use model data, but the dangers of using model data, of where to go for um, understanding the processes that are involved. And that might be processes of sea ice, but it might be processes of climate policy and how they influence uh, industries. And there might be aspects of how we do economic evaluations and utility functions. So we want expertise so that we can not just take the data from the models, but interpret it in a nuanced and clever way. And I think there is lots of opportunity for that. The real danger we have at the moment is the tendency to invest in computer power and then in nice, clever web pages and databases that allow us to see really high resolution details of whatever you want at any point in the next century that makes it look like we have information, more information than we need. What we need is the expertise of, of, in lots of people to be able to say, OK, we know that we can't take that at face value, but this bit is likely to be right. This bit is wrong. This is where you invest in uh, resilience. That's some sort of answer. Your response hinted at something that was on my mind. I believe it was one of your challenging characteristics of the climate change situation, and that is multidisciplinarity or interdisciplinarity. That climate change is a problem necessarily cuts across ways of generating knowledge, if you will, about the world, interpreting the knowledge and making recommendations about what to do. Cuts across these boxes that we've established for better or for worse. In what particular problems does the multidisciplinary nature of the climate situation raise? And more importantly, what can be done about this, feasibly speaking? The consequences of the lack of integrated multidisciplinarity means that the information we have is less robust than it could be. I say it that way because um, I'm sometimes accused of saying, well, we don't have perfection, so we shouldn't, shouldn't do anything. That's not my stance at all. But my stance is very much that we do have understanding of a lot of issues in a lot of different disciplines, but we're not very good at bringing it together. So the what is presented to policy and the public is not a good representation of everything we understand. And there are a number of examples of that. One would be in the economics of climate change, where we don't represent what is well understood in the physical sciences as well as, as, well as we could. I think in the physical sciences and the modeling community, I don't think they represent as well as they could what the, sen the nonlinear sensitivities that are perhaps better understood within the mathematics community. Although the mathematics community doesn't study the system in a way that is useful for those of us interested in the real world, it's, to, it's too idealized. So they actually could learn a lot from the physicists, and both of these groups could learn a lot from. The economists in terms of directing their work at what uh, is going to be useful. So th th this kind of web of connections where people understand bits of it, but not as much as they, as they need to. And what can be done about it? I think that's really difficult. I do think that basically young folk, young researchers are very keen on this. They're very open to working across disciplinary boundaries. There's no lack of interest. And there's no lack of, of, of really bright people to, to uh, try and draw these things together. But if you want to develop your career as a researcher, that's a very dangerous thing to do, because in most universities, you're placed in a department and your promotion prospects are geared to achieving publications within that discipline. Most organisations that I know would say, Oh, yes, we encourage multidisciplinarity, but it's a second tier. It's sort of do everything you need to do to keep us happy. Publish in top journals in your discipline. Oh, and then if you want to do multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary as well, that's great. But that essentially makes it very difficult. Not impossible, but very difficult. And I think we, we just need to recognise that. I think universities, I think the funders need to recognise that actually we, we need to understand it in a multidisciplinary way. And that means creating career prospects to say that's something worthwhile doing. There are moves in that direction, not as strongly as I, as I would like. But in, in the UK, over the time it's taken me to write this book, there are, there are starting to be 
moves in in that way. And at the moment, I'm in Germany, and I've heard that there's a Max Planck Institute being created now uh, to look at the multidisciplinary aspects of climate change. So, so I'm not entirely pessimistic. I'm, I'm quite optimistic that some things will happen there. I'd just like them to happen an awful lot faster. That's a good segue to what is typically our closing question. And that is one which attempts to balance out the often dispiriting nature of confronting climate change. What gives you optimism in this world, whether it's regarding climate change or, or more broadly? I think the young people I meet are really interested and want to find out as much as they can. And they tend to be passionate as young people always have been. They want to create a better world. So youth always gives me optimism. Um, I would also say, I think when societies change, when things change in, in society, they can change very, very quickly. I think trying to get change in society can be very, very difficult. But when it happens, I think it can happen tremendously quickly. And that tends to be what, where I peg my optimism. Yeah, I'm not sure I can say a lot more. Our guest today on Challenging Climate has been David Stainforth. His new book is Predicting Our Climate Future on Oxford University Press. David, thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for listening. Please rate or review us on Apple Podcasts and elsewhere and consider supporting us on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash challenging climate.